Great. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Situation Room for uh, um, this session on preparing for future migration scenarios. What a great topic to end this Davos week. Um, I'm Sara Pantuliano. I'm the Acting Executive Director of ODI. ODI is a London-based think tank which, amongst other things, hosts the Human Mobility Initiative. And that's a leading platform that builds on the long-standing work of ODI on um, displacement and migration which, amongst other things, you know, included advising on the historical global compact um, for migration that was adopted in Marrakesh just recently. So I'm really <coughs> delighted to be hosting a discussion on such a critical issue and with two fantastic guests, which I'll introduce in a moment. But why are we discussing this? I mean, actually, this week in Davos, I heard so much you know, around migration, the pressure of migration, the narratives around migration. Migration is a fact of human life. It's, it's, a, it's always been with us. Surely we've seen you know, accelerated pressures around migration over the last few years. The flows are increasing. We have you know, an estimated 244 million migrants in the world today. However, you know, people often forget that the vast majority of you know, migration movements happens in the regions of origin of migrants. And yet we see these very polarized and quite toxic debates about you know, migration in Europe or you know, the lockdown on the US-Mexican border. And you know, we are missing an opportunity to think how we can reframe this debate and think about how we can help leaders um, address, well, first of all, the drivers of migrations, but also the opportunities that come from migration. So to discuss such a critical topic, I have two great guests with me today. Um, Natalia Kanem, who is the Executive Director of the UN Fund, Population Fund, the UNFPA, and Professor Eyal Wiseman, who is the professor, I'm going to need to check the details on that. Um, it's got a great title, of Spatial and Visual Cultures and the Director of Forensic Architecture at Goldsmith College at the University of London. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Um, yeah, we'll start with you because you've done some really interesting work to try and you know, visualize the challenges that come from some of the flows and the movement. Um, and very recently, you've done a reconstruction of you know, the, the incident between the Sea Watch and the Libyan Coast Guard. So we'll have a, a look at that. Um, you'll take us through it, and then we'll talk about it. Yeah, thank you. Um, I would like to start actually with this image, which is uh, the wall that Israel built through the West Bank. Of course, this is not um, an instrument that comes to regulate migration, but it has been the symbol somehow of many such uh, approaches. In fact, you know, the, the wall that Trump wants to build on the US-Mexico border very much takes its cue from it. Uh, in a sense, um, it is um, together perhaps with the Berlin Wall become like the symbol of a new kind of new world order uh, as it has been referred to. And we can see all those borders, um, a hardened border that are being placed or being built now, planned around the world and on Europe's fringes, making what is referred to uh, as Fortress Europe. And I think it is important to mention that because the Mediterranean is itself functioning like a wall. Um, if you think about it, um, walls are more like concepts than physical entities. Not all the walls are walls, many of them are fences. Some of them uh, are effectively guarded natural barriers, uh, like mountains, cliff edges, um, water bodies. Uh, to a certain extent, one could even think about Brexit as the wallification of the English Channel. Right? In a sense, it functions like that. You don't need to build a wall. Somebody has built a wall in there already uh, in the form of uh, a deep waterway. Uh, but the Mediterranean that has been very much a space of connectivity, very much a space of flows, um, organized life, to life around it uh, in the Roman time with a Mare Nostrum, uh, kind of concept, however imperial it might be, the Mediterranean was a space of flow and exchange. Now 
in the words of uh, uh, another Italian, maybe a common friend, Stefano Boeri, uh, it has turned into a solid sea, right? Solid, not in the sense that the water there are not liquid anymore, but functionally, conceptually solidified. And that solidification is a result of both um, physical measures, juridical measures, and practices that I'm going to speak to you about. So the world, the, somehow we see a certain inversion of sea and land, where the sea became solid, and the continent behind it, or whatever is the edge of the Eurasia continent, uh, the, Euro, the spaces of the European Union became more or less fluid, right? We have this kind of inversion uh, within those things. So I'm going to take you through a recent piece that um, Forensic Architecture, the organization I run in London, this is an organization that provides evidence for prosecutions and human rights organization is written together with a sister group, in fact, uh, an affiliated group called Forensic Oceanography, uh, and two very good friends, Charles Heller and Lorenzo Pizzani. We've together uh, with a group also of lawyers, uh, international lawyers, uh, Violetta Moreno Lax and Itamar Mann, uh, came up with um, a forensic juridical approach to that question, and that is. Um, was exemplified both in that piece, in this op-ed in the New York Times, and in a legal petition that we're putting uh, in the European Courts uh, for Human Rights. Again, a kind of uh, an attempt to challenge um, uh, the solidification of the Mediterranean. Now, what is it, what is the problem, and how is it being uh, actually uh, addressed? Um, in a sense, the uh, migration issue, I, I would not call it a migration problem or a crisis uh, in Europe, lead um, European governments and the, mainly the sort of the southern littoral states, let's speak now about Italy, um, to solve for themselves one uh, of the biggest problems, that when uh, migrants are at sea, and uh, when the boat is in trouble, a lot of the migration comes in the spring and summer months, but as you know, in the Mediterranean, this is where the seas are rough. Um, the boats on which uh, people are coming are not of great quality. When there is an SOS call, um, boats around, whether commercial, military, uh, excuse me, or NGOs must intervene by law, must take them, and the law says that they have to be brought, migrants have to be brought to a safe port. And the idea of a safe port, since the uh, problems in Libya and in other places in Northern Africa, is in Europe. And when they come to Europe, uh, migrants have to be uh, processed uh, for asylum. And this is something that the Europeans now want to um, preempt before it happens. So to that policy, and what I'm going to show you in terms of films and images, uh, is a kind of a two-pronged policy. On the one hand, they want to take out the NGOs that do the rescue. Um, so very, from my perspective, uh, very impressive, young, committed, um, members of NGOs, Italian, Spanish, German, uh, are operating in the Mediterranean, responding uh, to SOS calls, and bring the migrants back to Trapani uh, in Sicily or to Malta. Um, that is a problem for the EU. So those organizations have increasingly been criminalized to an extent that um, the EU accused them of being people smugglers. When they're people smugglers, the boats are confiscated and uh, not doing what uh, they should do. And all those headlines are speaking about the fact that there is a great push against the NGOs. On the other hand, somebody needs to do the rescue. So Europe is, is paying um, the, um, the Libyans to do it. And I'll show you the consequence of it, and I'll speak about it later. Now, what allows us to intervene 
is a new reality in the ocean. Think about it previously when something happens in the ocean. It's the, it's the kind of the black hole of knowledge. You don't have even satellite images. Uh, the satellite image comes switches off. The, the, um, they don't want to waste data on, on the ocean. It's very hard to get information. But now both um, migrants, the NGOs, and somehow also the, the, the military vessels that um, uh, are in the Mediterranean all have a lot of uh, images. So we can start adopting and developing a forensic view uh, on things. Um, I'm going to show you a little bit how we do it. Um, we are working now in developing what we call the visual radar. It is based on a GoPro camera, or just carry-on camera, clip-on cameras, um, on, uh, here on an NGO boat. This is a relatively simple rescue operation uh, by the NGO, the German NGO, Jungen Rettet, uh, that uh, because the, the boat, while doing safety measure while taking refugees in um, is rotating around themselves. They record the panorama and we can start mapping all the boats and we can start seeing the relation between the different actors on it. Something that uh, was very difficult to do otherwise and of course migrant boats do not have uh, AIS data, i.e. the kind of the, the location, uh, digital location, so that is extremely uh, important. But then we're faced, and why is it important? Because we're faced with reality like that. Here, uh, the Italian prosecutor uh, claims that what we're seeing here in that scene uh, that has taken place uh, in June 2017 is a proof that the NGOs are people smugglers. They say the rubber boat, here is the rubber boat uh, of the uh, mothership is the Juventa. These are German activists. You are seen dragging an empty migrant boat after a successful rescue, and they claim, the Italian prosecution claimed, that they're dragging it towards the Libyan coast. Now, how do we know that they drag it towards the Libyan coast? And of course, that leads to the confiscation of the Juventa. The Juventa is still in Trapani, uh, not doing rescues, partly because uh, of this. What in this image tells us, give us any direction uh, to understand what is going on? Well, this is where we, we kind of come into uh, play and forensic oceanography and forensic architecture. We started by looking very carefully at the waves. And the waves, if you look at them carefully, you can start seeing direction. And using a very simple method called motion tracking, uh, we are tracking the direction of the waves. And as one does, build a 3D model of the dynamic uh, movement of the water in it and analyzing them very carefully. Then what one does is go to open sources and look for meteorological data. We have historical data of wind and current directions now and uh, we can find it. And when we do, we can compare it to um, the, uh, the architecture of the waves, if you like. And we could see that actually the NGO boat has dragged that migrant boat northwards, the complete opposite direction of what the Italian prosecutors say. So you would say, open and shut case, right? No. The Juventa is still confiscated, is still in Trapani, under all sort of now bureaucratical um, uh, reason of, of legal technicality. And um, more and more NGOs are leaving the Mediterranean and uh, abandoning effectively uh, the mission of saving those people that are in great need. On the other hand, what we see is the Italian interior minister um, in a ceremony de delivering a, a small uh, Coast Guard ship. Uh, Four more minutes. Sorry? Former minister. Yeah. Former minister. <laughs> um, delivering a, 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 a ship to um, the uh, Libyan military, uh, precisely with the intention of them um, doing the rescue and rather than bringing the migrant to safe port, bringing them back uh, to Libya. So um, 
we have reconstructed a scene that in which the Libyan Coast Guard has been uh, involved. Uh, we've, this is part of our New York Times uh, collaboration. Uh, look how many fo uh, cameras are on the uh, Sea Watch, another uh, German based organization. Um, and setting up those cameras in order precisely to protect themselves from these accusations uh, that they are people smugglers. Um, in August last year, a boat uh, was about to sink, uh, did an SOS call, people were holding on uh, to the shaft. It was uh, one of the most, uh, as emergency can be called emergency situation. They, they call the Italian Coast Guard. The Italian Coast Guard, by law, has to alert all the boats in the area. They alert Sea Watch, but they also call their partners and friends, the Libyan Coast Guard, who charges towards this boat in a way that should not be done. You do not approach a boat in distress by driving. Remember, that's the boat that was given to the Libyans by the Italian. Um, Directly uh, on the boat, people are in the water. This destabilizes further, and at least five people are drowning simply on this first uh, maneuver. People are in the water, and the NGO is um, trying to manage that situation, drag as many people as they can in. Incredibly chaotic situation uh, that is made worse, uh, and here you can see part of our analysis, by the Libyan Coast Guards effectively, oh sorry, here, here in, that, in that way you see how um, the Sea Watch member, that's the Sea Watch one, th this is the right way to do it. You put the boat a bit further than the shipwreck, you take a small dinghy or a small uh, rib and, and, and pull as many people as you can into it. But even with that a chaotic situation, people's lives uh, are lost and um, another several uh, migrants uh, are effectively uh, drowning. Look at the, this hand on the other hook. So near yet so far. In, effectively, the distance between Europe and Africa is the distance between here the, uh, the uh, NGO boat and the uh, Italian, uh, sorry, the Libyan uh, 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 military vessel. Um, the situation is made worse by the fact that the Libyan Coast Guard knows that what is expected of them is to bring migrants. In fact, they have brought about 20,000 migrants back into Libya. They're held, we will speak about that, in horrible conditions there. And um, you would see here in that proximity, again, between Europe and Africa, all, all the difference it would make to a migrant is whether they, they are managed to go up the rib or uh, on the military boat. Here, uh, you could see people um, knowing what to expect them in, in Libya, so just making a, a dash for it to the, um, uh, to the rib. Uh, and you could see, uh, in a second, you could see how the, the Libyans try to get the, 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 the rib, the Sea Watch rib, away, throwing hard objects at them. Uh, what you cannot hear now, because I don't play it, is the sound in which they curse them. They ask them to go. They threaten them. Uh, they tell them they're too close to Libyan water, although this is in, in open seas. And um, you would see here uh, the throwing. We identified an object that they throw uh, at them. While people are, be, uh, are drowning, the Libyans are attacking uh, those that save. Uh, and the consequence is here, you would see that this uh, person that we've marked um, is drowning um, because now the, the Sea Watch boat uh, has to retreat, having been attacked, and he is already in the water. He's drowning as a consequence uh, of it. I think that the responsibility for something like that is obviously initially that of the Libyan Coast Guard for their behavior, but who, the people that have ultimate control, and this is why the appeal is to the European Courts of Human Rights, uh, is uh, of, the, of the Italian government uh, that has trained, supplied, and in fact exercises here uh, a certain degree of control over uh, the Libyan one. So this is uh, the person that dies as a consequence 
of this thing. The remaining migrants are being beaten, chained, and they would be brought up. Is that all? Okay. I mean, I can probably, that's the end of my time, uh, which I've, I've, been, <laughs> I've been going on so uh, a little bit uh, more, than, uh, uh, more than necessary. But um, here the situation is, is precisely that. Uh, the European Union, uh, Italy, as, as the enactor of that, are, in our opinion, needing to answer a very um, uh, question on a juridical forum um, for effectively militarizing and effectively um, uh, hardening uh, the seas of the Mediterranean with deadly consequences. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Ayal. That was really powerful, um, you know, a, a, an incredible demonstration of, you know, the limits of the current approach uh, of to, sort of managing or pretending to stop, you know, migration flows, which, you know, you talked about Fortress Europe, we've done a lot of work on how, you know, ineffective the deterrence attempt are unsustainable and I would add, you know, inhumane in many ways and, if, you know, in a way continue to polarize the debate, <coughs> which instead I'll come back to you in a second about, you know, how we can influence the narratives um, differently. But obviously what we miss in this debate is looking at, you know, the drivers and how can we work more on the drivers and, you know, understand and act on the drivers of migration. So I'll, I'll, I'll come to you, Natalia, to hear what <coughs> your organization is doing. I mean, there is a lot of talk about, you know, population growth as one of the pressures, but we know that the pressures are multiple and there are all kinds of different, you know, pressures that accelerate um, migration flows. So it requires a, a collective response. Um, so how do you work with your colleagues in other UN agencies with the wider community of actors on this? Well, um, thank you for the question, and I'd just like to acknowledge how upsetting and harrowing it is to think that a young person, and in the main it's young people who are driving migration, leaves home with every expectation of a better life. And when you have disorganized, chaotic, and uh, lack of respect for human dignity scenarios like this, uh, it's so important for all of us to work together, and this is not just an issue for uh, a particular arm of a particular government. And it's very important also, I think, to have voices of civil society and the business community as well, because as we're thinking of the drivers and what is going to change that scenario, the work that UNFPA is doing as one agency, our focus is sexual and reproductive health and rights, and we measure very carefully census data and population trends, understanding that for a young person, the context of their identity and their ability to have an economic future in their home country is a huge driver. I think it's an oversimplification to call people economic migrants when you see the home conditions that are pushing them from the village to the bigger city from that bigger city to the capital. And our study last year looked at young people, uh, 30 and under, in four gateway cities. And um, these were migrants who were leaving Tunis, Cairo, uh, Nairobi, and Beirut. And we interviewed them to find out, how did you get here? Some were internal migrants within that country, but others had come through many, many routes. And we also interviewed them for where are you going and what do you think your prospects are, just in terms of the reality check of this is a harsh reality. And uh, many of these young people don't have anything remotely accurate by way of information. And so it was interesting to me to, to hear that 60% of those whom we interviewed, despite everything they'd been through, and a lot of it uh, also, for uh, male and female migrants had a huge disturbing dimension of trafficking and sexual violence against them. 60% of them still said that they would do it again. So as I think of the Cairo Program of Action, it's 25 years old, the Cairo Program on International, uh, uh, on Population and Development, it was actually far-reaching in a way that we need to be far-reaching today. 
This was the first agreement where 179 countries connected so many interrelated dots to address not just population dynamics, but all of the features including climate change and the fallacy that it is high population growth that drives climate change. I would like to also um, just briefly highlight, because I think there's so many different ways to look at this, that the question of uh, African young people in particular is distorted. They actually proportionally are fewer in terms of the migration population mm -hmm. than their counterparts from Asia and Latin America. But in a way, it really doesn't matter because what we're talking about is the prospects of reaping a dividend as a young person who is well-equipped, well-educated, and able to compete in an environment where we're going to have to depend on new technology for employment, but also to protect that precarious environment. Mm -hmm. And these far-reaching climatic catastrophes are not because of a villager chopping down trees in their backyard. I mean, that doesn't help, obviously. But the fact is that when we look at carbon emissions, and I've published about this just last year, it's negligible, the population growth factor in terms of what is, in fact, driving these climactic changes. Mm -hmm. So we need to become planners and to use population dynamics to understand how to invest in young people so that we can, in fact, reap the demographic dividend. And I think you know, that's so critical. I mean, if you look at some of the, the projections, we know that by 2050, we're going to have 830 million young people in Africa. And you just mentioned the impact of technology. We also know, you know from work actually that we've done in my institute, that in the space of 15 years, operating you know, robots in the US is going to be cheaper than um, you know, actually um, having labor in Africa in the manufacturing sector. So that will increase the pressure on the ability of young people to remain in employment in Africa unless we can help prepare them for you know, a, 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 the work of tomorrow, for the jobs of tomorrow. So what can we done really to make sure that we offer some sustainable, you know, long-standing opportunities to them? I'm, I'm yeah. coming to you. Well, <laughs> I think uh, the connecting of the dots is really the crucial point. As a migrant emigrates already, typically they're relatively, well, of course, I'm now talking about the disadvantaged migrant because I also have to put squarely on the table that a lot of us, myself included, yeah. are migrants who went after uh, a job opportunity that was offered because of how well equipped we are. But I don't think we have to worry about people who are trying to compete to get a high level visa mm -hmm. to become a, a professor or, a, or an engineer, et cetera. So when we're talking about the migrant who is leaving home under pressure, the question of how to equip them once they arrive where they're going to assimilate into society is something which I actually think we have uh, expertise in the, in the group here today to discuss. But I'm anxious that a lot of the new expectations as you have these cultural clashes can really lead to societal disturbances that lead to hostility towards migrants rather than the welcoming arms that we would want to envision in terms of human dignity. I also feel that for the female migrant in particular, the pressures of um, the risk that she's facing and also the attention to her sexual and reproductive health needs are almost like a taboo. And depending on what kind of society she's coming from, she's entering into a world of vast difference where you have to quickly adapt. So giving people the ability to adapt is a preoccupation of many United Nations agencies, not just my own, um, the migration uh, group, the uh, refugee group, because again, some, some of these migrants may be successful in getting uh, legal status, but there is a huge shadow group who do not have an ID card. And you can't function in many societies if you have no legal identity. So a big preoccupation of ours um, is to have a minimum set of criteria to establish the uniqueness of the human uh, person. A lot of this has to do far beyond fingerprinting with new types of technology, but also to guarantee the safety and privacy of people who need a legal identity. So there's a lot for us to engage with, and I think there's a big role for the conversation being 
a societal con conversation. It is not just about asylum alone, yeah. what happens to you thereafter. I think part of the problem in having a societal conversation is the type of narratives that you know, we see today. Political narratives, public narratives are really difficult to shift. I mean, you showed a few um, cutouts from Italian papers. I hear you know, the rhetoric back home, but also in the UK where I live, um, and how difficult it has been to shift these narratives. How do you see that? What can we do to shift the narratives? Uh, that's your technology. What has been the reaction to the kind of reconstruction that you've, uh, uh, you've shown us? I mean, our, our work um, in forensic architecture takes the entire itinerary of migration, and that is to say, from the, conse con from the consequences of um, climate change, interaction with conflict in places uh, in the Sahel, for example, through uh, the path of migration across the Sahara, uh, across the Mediterranean, and the violence against migrants uh, that is exercised in Europe. So we, our commitment to the topic is not only to look at uh, a kind of an incident analysis, but an incident in the way that we conceptualize it, is always like a knot of conditions that you need to unpack. You need to pull back the causal chains. Um, so it's not just the kind of the, 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 the mechanical relation between the boats, but you need to ask, why is this boat here? Why is this boat not here? What is happening with the boat we see in the visual radar? How can we actually unfold the world around the incident of which it is part. So an incident is very important in order to humanize the situation. You need to see the people that our policy led to their drowning. And, and it's hard to watch it. But you, you know, I mean, we believe that people need to actually see that, that this is not an abstract, you know, we know that upwards of 20,000 lives have been lost in the Mediterranean in recent years. But to see one in great detail and how actually how cruel it is and how somehow haphazard death is, no? The boat would have driven a little bit more to the right or left and that life would have been saved. So on the one hand, humanize and then pull out of the, of the, of the incident those uh, causal chain and, and look at the issue of migration as a long itinerary uh, in which indeed, I absolutely agree. The process is not, you know, once you are uh, on shore and perhaps a process, even when you successfully received uh, your asylum papers, um, that journey is not finished. Uh, it's it's an ongoing journey that we need to uh, that that we need actually to, for people to to understand and be exposed. To. I, mean, I find it really powerful, but I'd be really interested to know how much of you managed to you know share it you know, with. So people that can influence debates or political leaders, what the reaction has been? Is there you know, something that we can do with this technology that can help um, shift the debate further? Yeah, absolutely. So I think um, in forensic architecture and forensic oceanography here together, uh, what we do is uh, appeal to two kinds of forums. You know that you know, in, in the way that we conceptualize the word forensics, it's the art of the forum. And the forum is not only the bureaucratical uh, kind of judiciary uh, that, you know, that will process or not process, but it will take years and finally they would come up with some verdict on it. But to approach the public directly with the evidence, and especially when the truth and when the evidence is under such a threat, uh, so violated today by all sort of parties, um, especially uh, from the populist uh, right uh, in Europe and beyond, uh, that we need to be able to insist on fact-based um, accounts, on minute and very precise reconstruction, honoring the life lost uh, in that way, every life in as much as it comes uh, to us, and uh, indeed have a simultaneity of uh, forums that fora that we that we address the 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 legal one 
the public domain that we do for the New York Times, uh, connecting to uh, organizations, to activists, to grassroots uh, movements, uh, because the evidence need to act politically. It cannot otherwise it's just technical uh, knowledge. And, um, and this is at least our attempt uh, in that, um, on that level. But we do take a confrontational approach with, with the EU authorities. We do not advise them, for example, etc. I mean, we think that they need to, uh, effectively somebody need to pay a price for what, what we've just seen, a crime that was effectively existed already when it was legislated. Can I just add on the narrative um, that understanding root causes is also crucial, and I think uh, the recent effort called The Missing Piece, P-E-A-C-E, -E, um, which the Secretary General commissioned and which uh, UNFPA co-sponsored with the Peace Building Organization of the UN. This uh, series of, of uh, research efforts, and it's an ongoing program, The Missing Piece, speaks of young people and peace and security. And this is mandated by a resolution 2250 um, of member states. And when you look at the motivations of young people who are being radicalized, because conflict, which you alluded to, is another push factor for young people in their communities who can't coexist with certain drastic, and we see this, uh, the minister would have spoke, from Mali would have spoken about the, conf the cross-border conflicts in Mali that are destabilizing communities and causing these huge uh, shifts. So understanding the mechanisms of exclusion, the role of employment, and also the gendered uh, aspects of what happens when you have upheaval. And it can be war conflict, but it can also be crime and gang victimization, which forces young people to, uh, to move. So I think trying to really address how do we stabilize communities, it is still very true that most migrating young people would rather be in their own country, and many do eventually return. So trying to figure out that angle of why is this happening and how can we intervene at every step of the way is one of the things that we're looking forward to discussing with you. Thanks. We don't have a huge amount of time for discussion, but I do want to bring in the audience for you know, questions or comments that you may have. Can you please um, introduce yourself and take the floor and be brief in your remarks so we can bring more people in? Peter the Lohan, the you get the mic, please. Peter Lohan, Conrad Hilton Foundation. Uh, this has been very powerful. Uh, but to my mind, it is more bearing witness to current migration incidents than preparing for future migration scenarios. Could you also give us your best case and worst case scenario for 20 years out, and then think of how the, the techniques you're talking about now will be useful in steering toward the better scenario? Yeah. Okay. Hold, hold on to that. Let me, see. Okay. Let me bring in the, as many as we can, and then we'll do a final round, otherwise we'll, we'll run out of time. Please. Thomas Ogilvy from DHL. Um, so being obviously from um, a commercial player um, with a lot of frontline employees um, with, let's say, relatively low skill levels when it comes to employment in terms of sorting, in terms of delivery. And looking at Europe, what we see in terms of labor demand, there's a much higher labor demand in some of our countries than the local labor market can offer supply for. And also looking at the demographics, it's something where we see, and you can take it into consideration for Germany, but also for France, and you can also go into the Central Eastern countries right now, that um, due to the demographics, the labor demand cannot be covered. And even within the European Union, you could argue, well, there's high youth unemployment in Spain and Greece, but the people in these countries have no appetite to migrate, or not to the extent needed, into these countries. So. What we did over the last just two years, we employed in Germany standalone six and a half thousand refugees in sorting, in delivery, and by that offering them in a way a step into the society, which is one step. It needs to be accompanied by language skills, by in a way also adopting to society, but it's a first step. And what 
I would like to understand, and perhaps it's even a friendly ask, I think we could, in a way, factualize the discussion if we understand the global labor demand, which is correlated to demographic development. And I'm not talking about the top-notch talent, because that's something, like you rightfully said, that's in a way legalized or it's, it's taking place naturally, but it's about the simple job, so to say, and if we think also about Davos, who are the ones who are in um, the kitchens, who are the ones who are behind the scenes taking care of us, it's obviously people probably not from Switzerland, but from other places. And I think the better we understand and the more we bring this to public awareness, that there are many helping hands needed that our own societies, our own countries cannot supply, that could give, in a way, a number to understand how much migration is needed beyond the question of like talent migration. And perhaps that could also ease the debate in the way how to manage migration as a narrative into the supply countries, if I can call them like this, because if we have a clear understanding, there might be a need for a million or five or whatever it is, and that's the one we can also digest, perhaps also from a social point of view or from a public acceptance point of view, that might, apart from all the things that needs to be done in the origin countries, help to, in a way, at least steer or, um, in a way, yeah, correlate migrations. Unfortunately, we're good running point. out of time. One point. last comment here, briefly, please, and then we'll come back. Okay. Uh, Cecilia Kingsley from the Swedish Central Bank, and I'm really not an expert on this at all, so this is a very, probably a very simplistic question, but it seems like there's a lot of young men uh, being refugees, um, and uh, it was mentioned that also women are, are trying to flee, but um, I guess there will be a lot of women left in these countries, and I'm sort of wondering if you can elaborate a bit on what it means to the society if there's a surplus of women left. And an interesting historical parallel here is the uh, situation in the UK after the First World War, where there uh, was a surplus of, of women who didn't find a husband, and that moved uh, women's liberation to, to a great extent. Um, so about the gender balance in the, in the, in the countries where people live from, what, what can that mean to their societies? Very good points and comments. Who wants to start? I think. Well, uh, these are all great questions. <laughs> and I just want to make some uh, high level remarks given that, uh, and I'm happy to share more detail because I think as the Population Fund has a lot of information on each aspect, but considering the future prospects, the idea of longer term planning is exactly what needs to happen. This idea that you're going to fix this in two or three years is not going to be realistic. And thinking about data that can guide us in terms of key decisions, the census is one of the bedrocks. And this is coming up, 2020 is a big census year. We have technical advisors all over the world preparing. And the ability for the census to be accurate depends upon trust. And bringing people out of the shadows, if you will, so that we can count and so that we can have a much more robust estimate of where the world is going, means that the human dignity and legal identity arguments, which I made later and won't rehash again, are very profoundly important. If I fear answering the question, you're never gonna know that I'm even there. Moreover, as societies do age, industrialized societies do have this feature, and UNFPA actually, Next uh, month, we're opening a new office in Seoul to deal with aging um, issues that are very much burgeoning. But trying to match migrants with a destination that's welcoming is a brilliant point, and I think uh, more of us need to pay attention to doing that kind of predictive uh, uh, work. And then the last point I'll make about the gender is that it's a very astute comment. We haven't actually had a lot of uh, concrete information about this, but. We are today talking about migrants, not refugees per se, but in many of the refugee communities where we interact with women, being a sexual and reproductive health agency, this dynamic is a major one. And it is re leading, I guess, optimistically to more resilience and women being more active agents. But there is a distortion in expectation, in hopes, in the family cycle. And in Syria, for example, uh, I've met with girls who are just very 
uh, clear-eyed that I'm not going to get married, I've been prepared for this, I'm a teenager now, and I've got to figure out how to get a job and how to learn to code and do other things that are going to make me self-sufficient. But you may have some... Uh, we don't have much time, but no, uh, actually, in fact, we don't have it all. So. No, but <laughs> if if I could also to Peter's um, point about you know preparing for the future, if you could, both of you sum up in one sentence, you know, one action that the leaders of Davos should focus on to really help prepare for f future migration scenarios. What would your I think the be? problem is, and this is what my colleagues in forensic oceanography would say, the illegalization of migration is what makes it's so dangerous, it's what makes it so difficult in all those problems. I think those issues need to be uh, legalized, in fact accepted, um, that the aspiration of young people, whether it is in Mali, in Eritrea, uh, etc., to come need to be as simple as boarding a plane, an easy jet, and uh, applying for a visa on, on arrival or, or before. I think that the, the numbers of casualties that we see along the route are, are so staggering that uh, I think this, is, this policy is just aggravating. The, the illegalization of migration is what is, what is happening. So we need a, a, to completely think differently about the entire architecture of movement. Natalia, one sentence. I would say that we do need to connect the dots. I've just come from Senegal, a fishing village where the fish are not there anymore. It is not the fault of the fisher folk that uh, whatever the issues may be, fish are disappearing and they no longer are going to be a fisher person staying in that village. So I would advocate that governments adhere to these principles, which actually were founded 25 years ago at that International Conference on Population and Development, where we said that human dignity has to be part of this contract. And that really means that approaches to migration as well as to population growth, have to be taken with all their complexity. And that human security is part of this, hunger, conflict, all of the other factors that we've spoken of. So at the, uh, at the uh, outset, I would say, we also need to be willing to face the data and to analyze it and to collect it and to use it so that we can be better planners. I think that was the idea behind the compact, which yep after a lot of contention, did succeed. The one on the, uh, uh, on the migration side, the refugee one, was a bit uh, uh, also uh, uh, fraught. So that we understand that uh, migration has occurred for millennia. And that's how we all ended up wherever we may be. But the orderly flow and one that respects human dignity is, is, is what's going to make the big difference. Excellent. I mean, this is a debate that we could sort of <laughs> carry on for a long time. My takeaways in you know, 30 seconds uh, really think and promote the debate around safe and legal routes. Data, critical, the facts, reestablish the facts that have been distorted so much. Um, address the drivers, engage with the drivers, you know, that ultimately is the, the most critical things. And I think for those of us who live in Europe is reframing the debate. I think part of the problem is that we have a language that focuses and is the same in the US, you know, as a language of crisis. And I think that needs to be reframed into a language of manageability. These are very manageable numbers, but we are, um, you know, depicting the debate around, you know, human mobility, whether it's migration or, you know, displacement as a language of crisis. We can deal with that, especially in developed economies. If in, uh, you know, much in lower income countries, can, they can take much bigger numbers of people who move. With that, I would to thank the forum for hosting this debate. Thank um, Eyal and Natalia for um, such an engaging discussion, all of you for participating. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Sir.